Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, once again, my name is Janice Brown, um, and I'm joined today by Jamie Blako, um, who's going to uh, assist me in this session demystifying Oracle User Productivity Kit, UPK. Okay, so welcome to this session. Um, just to say, really, that the agenda, in the agenda, we're going to start with a quick update on uh, the latest message from Oracle, and then we're going to provide uh, an overview, really, of uh, UPK in two areas, the developer and also the knowledge center. And, of course, uh, for the last five or six years, those two products, um, has been sold as one. So even if you don't have both products, just be aware that is what you've paid for. So we're going to uh, cover those um, off this afternoon and then talk about really what options there are for upskilling. Just in case you uh, had any doubts, this is our pedigree really around uh, UPK. Um, been working with the product since about 94. Um, joined Oracle when they acquired UPK uh, in 2009. Um, and have obviously gone through the ups and downs of the product uh, ever since. So we're quite a small niche team, initially only focusing on UPK, uh, but we now work with other technologies as well. Um, as you will be painfully aware, I'm sure, UPK really hasn't changed for four or five years now. So that has caused us to um, look, look, look further afield, really, for some of the functionality that our clients need uh, for their learning and support. So a quick update then on Oracle UPK end of life. Um, we were advised formally in 2016 uh, that Oracle would cease to support UPK clients past April 2019. So what that did was uh, actually cause us to uh, start a, a search of uh, what we called a market scan for multiple other applications to see what else was out there. Um, and in 2017, sure enough, we found a tool, we took it through proof of concept and actually launched it um, as the Llama Brown platform. Of course, in December, um, we had uh, our latest upgrade, 12.1 ESP4, and then in July, uh, Oracle effectively did a U-turn and announced they're going to extend the end of life to December 2022. We understand the reason for that is that a few of the large public sector clients in the states had invested heavily in the technology in 2017, and it became very tricky for Oracle not to con agree to continue the support. So Premier Support, as it's called, is paid annually. It's uh, charged at 22% of the purchase price, uh, and what you get for that is um, annual maintenance and, and support, annual maintenance and support via an invoice by payment of an invoice, which is raised by the Oracle Renewals team. So you could be renewing your maintenance and support, even though you previously thought that UPK was going to be end of life, um, and now be aware, obviously, that uh, it's going to be extended. Or it may be that you opted not to renew so in terms of what does that premier or extended support mean, it basically means that Oracle have undertaken to ensure that UPK is compatible with all browsers until December 2022. So that means if you have something like uh, Microsoft 365 and you have your automatic updates activated, or indeed if your organization um, opt to update your desktop and you obtain new technologies, new browsers on that desktop, Oracle will make sure that your users and indeed your content authors can still access that content. However, there will be no new features or functions. Okay. Now, as you may be aware, this is the first of, I think, three or four uh, webinars that we're doing, um, and basically what we're looking to do in this one is give you a, a good thorough understanding of the product as it arrives out of the box, and next week we'll be actually looking um, deeper diving in some areas and looking at how you can maybe refresh your content and bring it up to date. Uh, but there will be no new features or functions from Oracle. If your support has lapsed, it can be in reinstated. So we've checked this with the Oracle Renewals team and indeed the senior VP of, of UPK. You can get your uh, support reinstated by paying the back support. So everything that you should have paid, if, for example, your support 
uh, renewal was due in January and you didn't pay it thinking that the product was end of life um, and there would be no new updates. Now, as long as you backdate and pay that invoice um, for the entire desupported period, then actually you will be able to download the latest version and get all the maintenance and support uh, that we've sort of alluded to above. Okay. In order to do that, if you are not sure whether you have renewed support, you can contact your Oracle account manager or indeed contact the Oracle's renewals team. Now, if you don't know who those people are and you're desperately trying to find someone to try and ascertain that, and I appreciate that in a large organization quite often you're never really quite sure uh, what you've brought, um, it is possible to uh, just drop me an email with your details. And what I will do is I will introduce you, I'll ascertain who the right person is and introduce you so that you can actually ask them those questions. Okay, one condition in order to get this support is that you must upgrade to the very latest version of UPK. So that's version 12.1, Service Pack 4. Okay, that version was released by Oracle on the 22nd of December 2017. One thing to be aware through all of this is that UPK has only ever been sold as a perpetual license. So this means when your organization purchased UPK, you actually brought a license to use it indefinitely. You are not obliged at any time to purchase maintenance and support. Okay. However, of course, to some extent, if you don't purchase maintenance and support and your browsers are going to be updated, then really you've got a problem anyway. You could, of course, just output documentation, um, but obviously the simulations and all the tracking and reporting won't actually work. Okay, so let's just take a quick look at UPK then. So we know it's a mature product, very mature. We know that it provides deliverables for the entire project, so it's not just for training and support. It is a content development tool that gives us simulations and documentation from one recording. Okay, We actually get in-application support, also known as Do It Mode. So potentially what you're looking at is one recording that will enable you to offer your users simulations, e-learning with See It and Try It, etc., plus the documents, so you get training materials, uh, PowerPoint slides, job aids, and test scripts, all out of that one recording. You just check a different box, okay? If you record by job role, then everything can be actually published and available by job role. In terms of support, in its day, it really led the market. In application support, performance support, or just-in-time training is where the users are live in your application, they need support, and they can obtain that support very easily, context-sensitive to where they are in the application. So if I'm in eBusiness Suite, JD Edwards, whatever, and I have an issue or a lack of understanding, I can, in those applications, click on the, the Help button and actually obtain a filtered view of all the content that's been created. Okay, We call that in-application support. Everything that we record in UPK is SCORM compliant. So that means you can track it in any learning management system that supports SCORM, and they all do now. Yeah, Even the freeware tracking and reporting tools actually give us SCORM. Having said that, of course, UPK is shipped with the Knowledge Center, which is a SCORM learning content management system anyway. So if you haven't got one already, there is this tool available for you to use. Translation into 27 languages, secure user authentication in the Knowledge Center. So the Knowledge Center is the training portal, the light learning center, if you like. By job roles, as I said. And of course, we have pre and post assessments that then enable us to track and report on users' activity and achievement. So this slide really just talks about how the different deliverables that you get from UPK actually support you across the project all from one recording. Okay, so as I said, UPK is two applications. It's really the development library and also the knowledge center. So we're going to start with the development library. I'm going to talk about the outputs that we get from recording that content. So this is typically how we would structure 
the developer library. Normally you would have module section topic. You don't need to. And indeed, what we've seen recently is that our content developers prefer a flat structure. They prefer to just keep it all very simple. Okay, and that's fine as well. That works very well. We also have questions and assessments. Everything tends to be linked by what we call concept panes. So the idea is that in UPK, when you record a process against your application, the steps are automatically captured by UPK and the speech bubbles are automatically populated. The concept panes enable you to explain to the user what it is they're going to do, what the objective is, what the concept is of what they're about to do. Of course, the other great thing with UPK is that we can bring content packages in from any external content, anything at all can be brought into UPK and actually become part of your content. Of course, if you decide to deploy the Knowledge Center, the Light LMS, then we can bring that content into the Knowledge Center and basically assign it to Knowledge Paths. Now, Knowledge Paths are really learning paths for users by their job role or their user group. So what you do is you bring in your users en masse, but you specify perhaps their job role, their manager, their location, whatever. You bring in that information, and then you align their user profile to a knowledge path, the knowledge path containing the content. As the users then work through the content, everything they do and complete in the knowledge path is actually tracked and reported. And of course, there is a hierarchical system, so the training manager or some manager, uh, one of the, the departmental managers, can actually log in and see those reports and see what activity and what achievement has been achieved. So just quickly looking at the different interfaces and outputs from the development library, it has um, a document management system, so you can check documents in and out and you can roll them back. That is great when you have multiple authors. Typically, you would create some form of workflow where your subject matter expert would do a, a raw recording and then uh, a trained up, experienced content author would take that raw recording and refine it and edit it and publish it for your users. It is possible to install this uh, development library locally. So some clients have just put it on a desktop, on an author's desktop. If they do that, if you opt to do that, you don't get a lot of the functionality, and that includes the document management and the multi-author workflow functionality. What you do still get, though, is recording, editing, and publishing content, and you still get the one recording gives you multiple outputs. You also still get performance support and the web-based player. So the web-based player is a player package that you can create from the development library that has see it, try it, etc. And Jamie will be showing us those in just a while. So this is a screenshot that actually gives us uh, an example of the simulation. Everything can be branded. We're using default branding here, as you can see. But typically, the learner will be faced with all the content down the left-hand side. And you can see that they basically click on these pluses to the left of the purple book, and that will open up all of that content. And as they work through that content, typically the author has recorded and published to all of these different outputs. See it and try it are simulation. See it takes them straight through the process. You can pause or fast forward it if you wish. Try it gives them interaction. So with try it, they can basically consolidate their understanding in a simulated environment. Lots of documents, training manuals, job aids, test scripts, PowerPoint slides. The training manuals come in two forms. You can have one for the instructor and one for the end user. And over on the right-hand side, again, you can see a typical uh, training manual with step-by-step -step instructions and a screenshot um, and also the default Oracle UPK branding. Support, well, we get Know It for support, which enables the users to test their own understanding. Do it is the in-application support where the users would actually click on a button, a help button usually, and actually up would pop this floating window, actually giving them step-by-step -step instructions live in the application. And of course, we have quick reference cards, which are like flashcards, if you like. 
The Knowledge Center is the secure learning portal, and this is where Jamie is going to start. He's going to start with the Knowledge Center, where basically learning content from any source can be stored, tracked, and reported. So that means if you've got content that you've created in other products, maybe even in Word or PowerPoint, you can bring all of that in to the Knowledge Center. And you can assign it by job role or user group. And we can make that secure. We can also introduce this Windows authentication. As I said earlier, the Knowledge Center also gives us pre and post assessments and tracking and reporting. Now, this is a typical assessment. I think there are 11 types of assessment. I'm not sure. I'm sure Jamie will remember. All sort of things like multiple choice, hotspot, true, false, etc. Okay. All of those questions can actually be used as pre-assessment as here or indeed after the learning, whether the learning is in the classroom or definitely using, definitely using simulations, you can use pre- and post-assessment. Something that is unique with the Knowledge Center is prescriptive learning. And what you can see on this screen, the user has gone through an assessment and the Knowledge Center is basically saying, you don't have to complete these learning modules because you've got 100% or whatever your pass mark is. So one of the challenges we find is that when a user is faced with an upgrade to their application, whether it's a small or a sizable upgrade, trying to get them to go through the e-learning again is a real challenge. They're very resistant on the whole. So what we can actually give them is a pre-assessment outlining everything in the upgrade and assuring them that as long as they understand the content and they passed those assessments, they won't actually need to do the e-learning, hence prescript prescriptive learning. And here's a typical report. And you can see here, this report is looking at all knowledge paths across all user groups, but it's actually showing us progress by user. Can you see there, there's an admin user, Jamie, Rebecca Clark, etc. So depending on what information you require, one of those reports will usually give that to you. Now I'm going to hand over to Jamie. Okay, so what we are looking at here, this is the, the home screen of the Knowledge Center. So this is where we're going to start. And I'm just going to walk through and demonstrate some of the functionality that uh, Janet described there. So first thing, the Knowledge Center is, is a web portal, and there are some uh, basic branding things that you can do to it. So you can change uh, the style sheets behind it. To, for example, I have uh, inserted some of the lime and brown purple colors in here, and you can change your, your logo up there as well. So you can, you can give it your own sort of corporate look and feel uh, if you wish to. In terms of navigating through the content, uh, our users are up logged in as a user called Procurement. Uh, and it remembers, the Knowledge Center remember the last thing I was looking at, which was an Oracle EBS procurement content. It will give me a history on my home page uh, of the last five things I looked at, allow me to get to a usage summary of any content and perhaps any tests, any quizzes that I looked at. We'll, we'll sort of dive into that a little bit later. Uh, and on the left-hand side here, this is my navigation structure. So it allows me to actually get to the training content. So I'm going to start off with the player itself. So Janice described that from the UBK library, we can publish out what's called a player package. And that allows our learners to interact with the content and run simulations and see it mode, try it mode, etc. So if I just click on player first to go into there. So we've got a number of player packages. In this use case, we would allow our learners to decide exactly or make a choice on what they want to look at. We'll see when we get to the use of knowledge paths, we can actually direct them to what we think they should be looking at. But in this view here, they can look at anything they want. Okay, so this is the player. So on the left-hand side, we have our content. So we have our modules. So we've got Microsoft Office, getting started with the UPK, procurement, just some fun stuff in there. So it's really down to the instructional designer to decide what structure uh, is in there. So if I navigate down through Microsoft Office. Again, we can have further modules or sections, and eventually our users or our learners will get to what we call a topic. So I select deleting a macro. We can then see in here, this is our concept area. So this is a web page, really, that's running in there. 
we can have anything uh, in terms of text, images, multimedia uh, in there. And you can have videos in there. We go into the fun stuff. We've got a video on how going to Lapland. This would be only 12 weeks to Christmas, someone told me today. So if we wanted to, uh, we can play a video in there as well. Okay, so if you had training content that was very uh, largely video based, we can bring that in. So when Janice said you can bring in content from other areas, it can go into here. You could have a PDF, a, a web version of a PDF running in here as well, if you wanted to bring that sort of information in. But if I go back to our topic, deleting a macro, let's look at these different modes. So if I click on see it mode first, okay, so let me make this full screen. So we whatever we've recorded, and this is Excel. Uh, we start with an introduction, so we're going to see bubbles on each screen uh, to describe to the user or the learner what they're going to do. So in this one, uh, they're going to learn how to delete a macro. You can have links in these bubbles to additional bits of information. So if you wanted to link out to video or PDF, we can do that. Uh, if you wanted to have audio in here, you could also have narration actually inside the bubbles. Uh, and because this is see it mode, we have a player, quite simple and streamlined in terms of people can jump back a step, jump forward, start the recording, uh, restart, and you'll see a timeline going along as well. So if I start our simulation, any point I can pause. So you would have seen the cursor starting to move through the screen. So the way that see it mode works is that we have text in here. So we have text that an instructional designer, a human, can enter in. And we've also got text that's entered in there by UPK. So UPK is, is was entered the text to click the developer tab because when it records it understands what it's doing so it knows it's a click action it knows the name of that object was developer and it knows the object type was tab so that's inserted for us but instructional designers also come in and added some additional text on what somebody's doing in here okay so our, our learner would read that and just watch the simulation run through you can decide the, how long it, it the pause is between these steps. The standard one is sort of three seconds. And we can just see, you see here it's taken through a, a true simulation of that process. Okay, so that's seat mode. So if somebody's learning style is that they want to watch a process before they even interact with it, then seat mode's for them. Uh, from the same process, so we've recorded this process once, we can also output it as try it mode. We can reuse the same text. Uh, you'll notice that at the bottom of the screen, the, that player bar is gone because now we want somebody to interact. Okay, so I get the same bubble, the same instruction asked me to interact with this, but I now have to read it and complete that click action. Read what I have to do and complete the action. So it's hands on, completely safe environment, but it will be a completely realistic environment if it's recorded against a, a true uh, uh, a true production like environment. Okay, so that's that's try it mode, hands on. If I now go to note mode, okay, so note mode, again, we can use the same single recording, we record it once, and we just slightly change the text. So in this one here, it's saying we're going to test them. Uh, so slightly different introductory text. Uh, we can put a pass mark on it, made it fairly easy. It's only 50% they have to get right. And now when they start this, they get the instructional part of the bubble. We're telling them what we want them to do, but uh, the part that said click the developer tab is gone. So they have to have learned what this process should be. So we know it's developer, so I click on there, we can move on. Uh, if I get this step wrong, so if I don't click and open the macro box, I click over here, I get a little action to say, mm -mm, you weren't right, uh, do you want to try again? So I can try again. So it now gives me additional text, it now tells me what to do. I have to click the macro button, but still not where it, where it is on the screen. If I still get it wrong, click here, it will highlight it, starts to shout at me in red. Uh, and eventually, if I continue to get it wrong, it will assist me, complete the step for me. It's a cursor moving, and then I can go on uh, to the next step. Because this is in the Knowledge Center, this is being tracked. Uh, so I'm going to decide here not to be scored. I can jump back out. But the fact that I've been to see it mode, try it mode, if I completed note mode, that would all be tracked for me. Okay. Do it mode is point of use. So if I start the do it mode over here, so this sits on top of your desktop. So the idea with this, you have to launch it from an actual application if your application has an application support. So you can, some applications like Oracle EBS, PeopleSoft, uh, JD Edwards, within there, there is a help option. If you click help within those applications, it will launch 
uh, UPK and it will pre-select uh, a do it mode or help you select the appropriate do it mode. For this one here, because I'm just using Excel as an example, uh, we don't have that. But if I'm actually in Excel now, this will talk me through what I need to do. So the first thing you have to do is the developer tab and it gives me a screenshot. I can make this larger if I want. If I want to see more screenshots, smaller. I don't want the screenshot. I can actually turn the screenshot off, etc. So I would just complete the action and say, okay, what do I have to do next? I need to open up the dialog box. So it will talk me through this uh, in real time. When I get to the part that I'm comfortable with, I can just close this down, uh, go back to the live application and complete the task. Okay, so that's do it mode. I'll come back to an application support and just show you how, how that works in terms of, of UPK being smart enough for some applications to, to know what content is relevant to you. So I can, I can give you a demonstration of that as well. Uh, lastly in here, the mode we have is job help. So this is just one of the document outputs. So this is just a very simple HTML output. We've taken the screenshots off to make it as uh, compact as possible, and it's just the step somebody has to do. So if somebody wanted to have a printout of that or see it on their screen, they could do it. In terms of other types of document outputs you can get, if I go into here and just open up, so we can see here we've got a PowerPoint. Okay, so all of the screenshots, all of the text that we have is outputted into a PowerPoint, or it can be a Word document or a training guide or whatever you want. And there's no additional work required. All you need to do is just tick a box when you're publishing this out uh, and say, I also want a PowerPoint presentation, and that would be published out uh, with the player package. Other things we can do in here, some quite nice features. Share option. So if I click on Share, because the Knowledge Center is a web portal, then that you can share this topic with somebody else. So if you had a colleague that was stuck, uh, you could share this topic with them. If you worked on an IT help desk, rather than trying to screen share uh, so, or, uh, and see somebody's desktop, you could send them this topic. And you can actually have it down to a certain step in this topic as well. You can have the URL of somebody who was stuck perhaps on step number eight of a task. The topic itself could start at step number eight. Other things we can do in here, we can actually use roles. So there's a, a My Role option in there. So say if, we, if I just pull this back up to the highest level, it might be that all of this content is not appropriate to, or not appropriate, but it's someone doesn't have to look at it. Uh, it it's not needed for the job role. So we could start to put roles on this, and people can then filter this content by roles. But if we're going to go down that route, then really what we want to look at is that knowledge paths. So that's what I'm going to look at now. Okay, so I'm now back to my home page. Rather than going into the player, I'm going to click on Knowledge Paths. And the Knowledge Paths, when you get to this page here, I've logged in as a certain user. That user is part of a user group. A user group could be linked to a job role, and it only displays the content that's appropriate to me. So I'm a procurement user, so it showed me the Oracle EBS stuff. Everything else, Microsoft Office content is not there. A content, the how to book a holiday in Lapland is not there either. So those things have been removed. Okay, so that's based on my user group. So if I log as somebody, log in as somebody else. So let me come out, and I'll log in as myself. So if I log in now, you can see on my knowledge path page there's additional options in here. So the user group with the job role I have, uh, the Oracle EBS stuff is applicable. Microsoft Office is applicable, and also uh, how to use UPK. That's also part of my job role, so that's also applicable. So that's been linked to me. So I would see this when I log in. We can allow people to have some sort of choice. So if I click in Enroll or Withdraw, there's additional learning uh, paths in here that I could choose to look at. So another e-learning tool, Domino Flow, if I wanted to look at that. And perhaps I wanted to see some of the stuff on simple games. So I've enrolled in both of those. So when I go back, we can see that they're, they're now part of my knowledge paths. I've decided I don't want to look at them anymore. I can go back into here and say, actually, no, nope, that's games, don't want to look at them, and go back here. And it's just the ones I've enrolled in that are mandatory. Key thing here is I cannot withdraw from something that has been assigned to me as part of my job role. It's always going to be there. So if I now go into Microsoft Office, these are the activities that are associated with that knowledge path. So we can, again, have a decide from an instructional design point of view how we want to structure this. So Excel 
Outlook and Word are all at the same level, so I can take these in any order I want. But if you look at Word, we have Exploring Word, then using basic uh, document skills, and then basic text editing. And I can't go on to these second two of, until I've completed uh, Exploring Word. So if you want to have that tiered approach that they have to complete some introductory stuff before they move on to more advanced content, you can do that as well. So I start Excel. So this is the same player package we saw at the start. But what I've actually done here is that I've placed a pre-assessment on it. So we've somebody sees Microsoft Excel because it's part of their job role. And when they get to here, we can test their competence to make a suggestion of what they might want to look at. So if I start this pre-assessment, okay, so just some simple, very simple sort of fun questions in here. So uh, ask me, do I know everything about working with ranges? Oh, yes, of course I do. OK, gives me direct feedback. So you can have other things in here as well. And if you wanted to link them back to a bit of content, if they got it wrong, you could do that. But we kept it simple here. Next question, nothing left to, to learn on formulas. That's correct. And the last one here, I already know how to record a macro. Let's say, no, I don't. Don't know how to do that. So that's the end uh, of this simple pre-assessment. But what it's done in the power of this is we have assigned those questions to the content. So two of these questions were assigned to basics, and I've got them both right, 100%. So that means this basics has now become optional. So this basic macro, a basic module, I should say, up here is now optional. But I, I got the macro one wrong, or I answered to say I need more help with that. So it's now a required part of my learning. So if I now look at the personalized version of this course, you're going to see that only the macro stuff's there, because that's what I need to look at. If I go into here, I can now get to my play modes. But I, if I want to, I can see everything. I can switch back to the full version of the course, and we can see all the content. So it doesn't stop me from, from looking at all of the content. It just gives me a personalized view of that content and suggests what I should look at. What I can also do in here, uh, I've inserted a post assessment. So once I've done my pre-assessment, and I work through the content, go to the post assessment, start that. The post-assessment can be the same bank of questions. It can be a different bank of questions, depending on how you want to do it. And if I just quickly get all of these right this time, just for the reporting part, when we look at reports. And now we've got that pre-assessment, and that will show up as part of my reporting. And I'll show the full course. Yeah. Other things we can do in here, other options if you want to, we can add a note. So a note is a bookmark. So it means this will put a bookmark on my home page. Uh, so I can just jump straight back to this module. We can allow feedback. So feedback is just chat, really. You don't really expect a response to it. That's the course. Uh, and this can go to an a individual user, or it can go to a mailbox, and they would get a notification via email to say someone's made a comment on your course. So perhaps this might be the instructional designers uh, that look at that. The other option in here, we've got ask an expert. So this is a question and answer thing. So you maybe have a question about editing macros. How do you do it? Okay. And this is linked to the content. So this might go to a different set of individuals. It might go to somebody who's a specialist in Excel who can answer that question, and they be pinged an email. When they answer that email, Whoever asked the question would then get that response. So you can use this for, if you wanted to, you can have these functions on or off. And if you didn't, if you felt that was going too far because you already had a defined way of people asking questions about your system, you could turn these off if you wanted to. So that's the users working through through that content. I did talk about the in application support, so let me quickly look at that before I move on to reports. So if I open up the help for the Knowledge Centre itself, and the help has been built in UPK, strangely enough, we can see the, the applicable option is here. So it's pre-filtered the content in this player package that is relevant to the page that I'm on. Okay, so it's all about creating users, etc. If I came out of here and went into the manager view, and I asked for help on this page, it's a slightly different set of pages that appear in here. It's the same overall player package, the same repository information, but it's just filtering that to the page that I'm on. Okay, and if I went into Knowledge Paths, for example, this page here, and opened it there, 
it would filter it again. So it gives me, it, fil it automatically takes away anything that's not relevant to the page that I'm on, and then I can get to that content. And that content can be a web page like we have here, it could be a simulation. A do it mode, as I said, is, is quite often, if you're in a system, it would just give you the do it mode options for the different simulations that you could then launch to help you complete that task in the system. So that's sort of an application support part of it. So that's really how our, our end user, our learner, would get to the content itself. In terms of reporting, everybody can track their own usage. So on our home screen, we have this usage summary. So if I select that usage summary, we can see here that these are the knowledge paths that I'm enrolled in, either because it's part of my job role, so I'm auto-enrolled, or it's something I've decided uh, to manually enroll on. It gives me a list of all the activities that are part of that knowledge path, and then it tells me bits of information such as when, I, when was I last active. So we can see I've just gone in to that Excel 2010 a knowledge path or activity, and it gives me a, some information on how I'm performing. So the pre-assessment, I got 67%. The post-assessment, I got 100%. In terms of the subject matter, which are the topics, the see it, try it, etc., I'm only 4% of the way through that. So I can get an idea of how I'm performing myself. If somebody has the reporter functionality or the reporter permissions, I should say, they get this reports option. So if I click on reports, there's quite a host of reports. I'll just go into a couple of them. User progress is good. So user progress allows us, amongst other things, to look at an individual knowledge path. So let's just look at our Microsoft Office. And within that, we can look at different user groups if we wanted to as well. So just people in procurement, desktop apps, or it could be geographical location, anything we wanted in there. So if I just run this report, Okay, so we've only got two people that have been through this, myself and our L&D user. And again, we get an idea of how they're performing in terms of the subject matter itself, any assessments or quizzes that you have built into that tool. Deeper dive, just before we move off reports. I can do a skill assessment. So I click on skill assessment. This is where we look at an individual user. So let's look at myself. And again, let's look at something we know has an assessment as part of it. So I know uh, for the user we've selected, which is me, uh, I've completed two assessments for Excel. Uh, the pre-assessment, 67%, so we didn't get it all right. So if I wanted to actually know down to the level what question did I get wrong, I can select this one, run. And it will actually give me, again, a simple example, but I know looking at this that it was the macro question I got wrong. So if you could uh, look at an individual user and see where are they having issues in a, in a certain piece of training based on uh, questions that were getting right and questions that were getting wrong in an assessment. Okay, and lastly, the one we'll look at, uh, an assessment analysis. This is sort of the opposite of what we just looked there at an individual user. We can look at a group of users. Okay, so for this assessment we've chosen here, we can see it's been taken three times. The average score was 33%. And we can actually look to see what questions the group are getting right and getting wrong. So we can see here for, nobody's answered this macro question correctly. So zero, incorrect, three times. 100% of the time people have got it wrong. So we can probably suspect there needs to be either a, a learning intervention in there, some better training, or perhaps the question itself is worded poorly. But this gives us an oversight of how people are performing a, as a group for these assessments. Okay, so hopefully that's given you an idea from uh, an end user, a learner perspective, uh, how they can interact with uh, the UPK content once it's, been, once it's been published out, either as a player package where it could sit on a web server, any web server, or if you bring it into the knowledge center where the power of the knowledge paths come in in terms of pushing content out to people via job role and pre and post assessments, etc. So what we're going to do now is uh, follow the same format, really. I'm going to present a couple of slides around the development of content, and uh, Jamie is then going to provide a short demonstration. So um, in terms of developing content uh, in UPK, a couple of things just to be aware of. Okay, so first of all, um, when you record a topic, there are three elements recorded. So basically, you switch on the recording, and UPK captures the screen. It captures it 
as bitmaps basically so um, that is pretty flat content and that is why typically we have no issues getting that content uh, across networks and through firewalls etc so not only does UPK capture the screen, but it captures what we call template text. So it uses object recognition to recognize what the user needs to do to actually navigate through the process in the system. And it recognizes that because it's actually tracking what the instructional designer or the subject matter expert is recording as they go through the process. Okay. So you can see there in that screenshot, it's automatically picked up what we call the action area and the speech bubble. And on the right-hand side, it's giving the editor some options to maybe enhance that content. The third element, if you like, in the content, in a, in a straightforward piece of content, is what we call the cost custom text. And this is where, as an instructional designer or content author, we manually enter text to help the user understand why. So we know that UPK is going to record the step-by-step -step instructions and tell the user where to click. What we like to do as authors is actually put it into context so the user understands why. And typically, this would be a piece of instructional text. Use the GL field data to enter the date that identifies. You can see there. That is the instructional uh, custom text, and down here is the text that UPK has automatically captured. When we look at the interfaces that UPK offers, well, we know that the end user has typically got the content down on the left-hand side um, really to navigate through. And on the right-hand side in this large right area are the instructions. It actually gives them an indication of what that particular module, section, or topic is going to cover, including things like process flows and animations. The developer's view is very similar, but it's more complex. So this is the same piece of content with the same outline down the left-hand side, but of course the content author actually has all of these options in the menu bar and across the ribbon. And so actually creating content, whilst it can be quite simple on one level, can actually be quite complex. And one of the challenges that, that we find on projects is that quite often the people that have got the knowledge, the business process owners or the subject matter experts, they're not available to learn UPK in order to record content. Okay. So that's really where the Record It client comes in. Because what the Record It client does is it gives you a really simple way of just capturing content. And what we've seen is that on some projects, the Record It client is used right before go live just to get a process up there. So it's just a recording, really. You can add notes to it, but it is very simple and easy to use. The training on the Record It client is literally 10 minutes. And typically, as we get near the deadline, we use that Record It client to capture the raw records and then hopefully enhance them before we need to get them out to the user. Admittedly, depending on the timeline, sometimes that refinement happens after go live. So with the Record It application then, the process is captured by the subject matter expert or the um, business process owner who adds notes as required. The UPK developer, the instructional designer or, or, or author, then integrates those raw recordings into the UPK library and adds the instructional design and edit, and then that content is published to be consumed by the end users in the Knowledge Center, and of course that's where it's tracked and reported. So you can see really how the whole process, in, in, in uh, theory anyway, works. So Jamie's now just going to give us a, a quick, I think, five-minute demonstration of that before I then finish off with some options around next steps. So this is the recorded client we're looking at now. So it's a super simple interface. And there's only uh, just a few things we can do. We can record a new topic with or without sound. We can open something we've recorded before, or uh, we can save something so we can push it up into the full developer. So let me just very quickly sake of time just record something so just going to use Excel so you can see here a recorder is up the top there just press print screen and now in record mode and I just record what I want to do so let me just
that will do for the sake of this demo. Press print screen. Now back into the record it application. So then on the left hand side we have the screens that have been recorded. So notice here the object re recognition that Janice talked about. So it knows, uh, it was a left click, it knows the object uh, was a tab and it knows that object was called insert. I can change the if I want. So I wanted it to be a uh, capitals up there. I could do that so it would be in capitals when it goes into the tool itself or I could change the name of it. I could change the object type if I wished but UPK has taken all of that hard work uh, away for us because it's, it's, it knows what it's what it's been recording. So I would just go through here. If I want, I could add any notes into here. I can go down at the bottom that I'm just adding, just down here. So these notes would go to the instructional designer who's going to take this and make it part of a course. But in terms of capturing the screen, I'm done. If I wanted to record sound now, I could do. So I could put some audio narration over it after I've recorded it. Or I can just say I want to save this. Let's just put it onto the desktop. And that's my work done uh, as uh, an SME or someone who wanted to capture a process. Uh, if I then switch over to uh, an instructional designer, so this is another full UPK developer application itself, uh, I can go to and import that. So that a uh, topic file could be emailed to me, it could be put on a, a shared drive just so I can get it. So import that file. Okay, so straight away. Let's have a look at that file. Okay, so this is just what I've recorded now. So I can go through here, put additional uh, information, explanations, links out to other bits of content if I wanted. Uh, I could put uh, uh, extra text in for note mode. So I do my instructional design piece. But the essence of the process itself has been captured and UPK has pulled together all the screenshots and all of those actions. It's really just down to me to do a little bit of a polishing of that topic and decide where it needs to sit in terms of a, what, which course, which module, and then push that out to the Knowledge Centre and it would be available for our, our learners. Okay, so just to finish then, next steps. Um, I guess the first thing is to think about um, how to download or upgrade your instance of UPK if, UPK, sorry, if required. Um, I am sending you um, this recording, but you can see there that you can actually download the software with the documentation and effectively um, manage that uh, installation and configuration yourself. Alternatively, we do have a three-day workshop uh, to install that on your premise, or indeed we offer an annual agreement for managed hosting. And in fact, we host UPK for a number of clients who are out of maintenance and support. We just have to be careful about the version. So if you want any further information on that, just ping us an email back and we'll send you some details. In terms of content development, and I am aware that some of you are already developing content, but maybe um, you've not managed to get the Knowledge Center up and running. Maybe some of you um, haven't even started to develop content yet or were unaware of a good deal of the functionality. Things like the in-application support sometimes provides a bit of a challenge. Basically, you can, um, we can help you with upskilling, so we can actually train up your resources, either on-premise or remotely, um, via the quick start, and we do dissect and offer that quick start modulely if you require that, or you can just outsource the whole thing to us, and we offer a fixed price content management and maintenance service. So typically, those are the elements, if you like, involved in the uh, technical three-day installation configuration. That content or that work is included in the managed hosting. So if you opt for us to host for you, um, then you don't pay for the installation. We manage that, and we also manage all the subsequent upgrades and bug fixes and also the user profiles. The Quick Start does have a three-day discovery workshop, really. We call it Scope and Readiness, and it basically looks at um, you know, timelines, milestones, things like environment and job role, all of the dependencies, really. We also add to that all the scope, work planning, that sort of stuff, to actually make sure that you're getting 
uh, an idea of how to approach content development or indeed if you're outsourcing it, uh, what you need to be looking for. And of course, we are very hot on content development standards, making sure the guidelines to develop content that is professional and consistent are actually managed and uh, maintained. And indeed, some of that um, discovery work is included in the follow-on sessions that we're offering next week. We've got training courses, you can see there. We have a, an element of feature function pre-study, and then we offer labs and workshops, really. And we're quite happy to arrange for you to discuss with one of our training consultants where you are in terms of your understanding of the product and how perhaps you can get some of this additional functionality. So we're totally flexible, really, on all of that. The content maintenance and management service is where the client just wants to outsource uh, all of the content development. And what we do is we integrate with the uh, configuration team or the architects uh, and actually make sure that every time there's a new piece of configuration or indeed an upgrade, that the content is ready in a timely fashion uh, and is made available to the users. What we have seen is that a lot of our UPK clients have actually stopped developing content in the product, fearing the imminent end of life, and now wanting to pick that up and breathe some new life into it. Any questions before we finish? Okay. Right, if there are no more questions, um, I will turn the recorder off. <laughs>